Welcome back. It has been a pleasure to see some of the projects of Este and Elisaba with their students. Now we go to another slot. Um, and basically, we will talk about sustainability and we will keep exploring what is food design and all the aspects of food design. And we will do it with a really uh, amazing speakers. Um, we will have also Sonia Masari that will lead this session and will introduce or will help to introduce also the other speakers. Uh, just to tell you a bit, a bit about Sonia, um, Sonia has over 20 years of experience as a researcher, as you know, lecturer, consultant, designers in the field of education, sustainable food design and innovation, also in focusing agri-food sector. Since 2012, um, she has been a scientific consultant and senior researcher in the Varilla Center of Food Design and Nutrition Foundation to promote food education and new opportunities for young students and researchers in the field of sustainability. So I want to welcome you, Sonia, and the rest of the panels that will be with us today. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Gaston, for this introduction, and thanks to the Food Design Festival for this uh, invitation, as well as Singular Foods, uh, for having us here. This is the first time that uh, I'm going to present the edited book I've been working in the past two years. Uh, and for me, it's a pleasure, and I'm very happy to be here with some of the authors that are part of this book. I couldn't present this book without the authors, and I hope this will be the beginning of a journey in which I will invite uh, all of them uh, one by one article and to, to talk with us about the purpose of the articles they wrote, but also to be, uh, in a way, um, inspiration people for other people who wants to enjoy the field of food, the field of sustainability through the design methods. So I'm going now, uh, first of all, let me thank my, my colleagues. I will have the opportunity to introduce one by one them and their articles, but let me say thanks to Emily, Samuel Ballantyne, uh, Professor Lorenza, they're, they're all professors. So let me call you without any any affiliation and stuff, Lorenza Sganzetta, Angel, Angela Colucci, and Jonathan Dauch from, uh, from United States, uh, Lorenza and Angela from Italy, and Emily Malentin from Australia. We are in the middle. So we hope uh, we will have him again with us. I'm going to uh, share a very uh, short presentation that will help us uh, in a way to understand uh, uh, how the book it is uh, um, it is organized, but also how it was uh, structured. Let me see if I will be able to get through this. No, I knew something could happen. Okay, I think now it works. After one year and a half of doing uh, online Zoom and stuff, uh, seems weird to to make any mistake about it, but still, we do make mistakes. So the book is called Transdisciplinary Case Studies on Design for Food and Sustainability. And when uh, uh, Helsevier, uh, the publisher, asked me to think about an academic book or a book that was based on a specific target in academia, they asked me to think about what were the words, the most difficult words to be used to define the complexity of food. And for me, a few words came out, transdisciplinary, so what does it mean to work in a transdisciplinary way? Design, seems to be weird to say that, we are in a festival about food design, but for me, design, it's still an abstract and a very, not very well understood word and concept. And then food and sustainability, together or separate means complexities, that need to be in a way included in our curricular, but also in a transmission of knowledge and competences that the public, so the people need to know more about it. So this volume in particular, it was created for a special series, which was dedicated to consumer science and strategic marketing. As you maybe know, and maybe a few maybe know, uh, we are not so close to marketing as designer, I mean, uh, we are trying to find a common ground uh, since the beginning. Sometimes we work well together. Sometimes it's not so easy. So there is also like a balance to create it. And for me, this was great because it was a challenge. 
let's bring the design approach, let's bring the design mindset, let's bring the design method in a volume that is dedicated to people that nowadays are working in the marketing field. And it can be interesting to listen, to see, to view how designers think, but also how designers approach to the food system. So for me, it was a great challenge, and I have to really thank my, my editors, uh, um, Alessio Cavicchi and Cristina Santini, for bringing me in, the, in this journey. And the idea was to cry, try to create an edited book that was able to analyze the interconnectivity between sustainability, food, design, but in particular, this was my mission in the past 20 years, demonstrating that design can be really included in various fields of studied food related or also not food related. So transversely connected with food. Nowadays, uh, we are really teaching and we're really exploring how we can get concreteness to the sustainable development goals, to the 17 goals. Most of the time, the best is to start from an assumption saying that food is transversal to all of the 17 goals. So if we're able to work on sustainable food system, food experience, food choices that are sustainable, we will be able to get impact in all of the other sectors transversally. So this is a very strategic way of thinking how to use design and design method. And this is why I decided to, and I really like it, the fact that this specific series is based on case studies. So if you go through the series, you will see case studies on wine and food, case studies on, on social um, food approaches. But for me, it was great the fact that uh, it is based on case studies. And the case studies approach really help in a way to connect together the academics and the practitioners. Most of the time, specifically talking on food, we still have a gap. We still need to create bridges between who is working inside of labs, who is working inside of university, and who needs our innovation, our ideas, our solution to bring this in their daily life, in their work life. So definitely including practical example was one of my main goal. But first of all, it was to provide them this idea to start from practical issue, to go to theories, to also clarify and giving the dignity to, to, to the design disciplines to show that the design can be a powerful tool and the designer should be a powerful person, a powerful provide, that it can be included many times when we have to solve, when we have to create food system that really works. So for me, this was, again, another interesting and important mission when I was teaching in the past 20 years, but also when I was presenting to people that are far away from our field, what does it mean using design in the agri-food sector? So to policymaker, for example, to scientists as well, as well to people that are taking care of the entire food supply chain from production, distribution, commercialization. And many times the question was, so what the designer do? What designer can do for us? So this is why, this collection of uh, 18 case studies, which of course they cannot be exhausted. I mean, they cannot really cover everything. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't co cover uh, everything related to the food system. In a way, can be an inspiration, can be a starting point, can be a starting point to think differently about the approach of the design and the role of the design in the food system. So practically, I really want the people uh, by reading this book, start to consider the impact, uh, start to consider different kinds of assessment metrics that we can use to, uh, in a way, identify and also, in a way, to um, include the values, different values, in what we, um, we quantify and we, in a way, uh, consider be important. So in, in marketing, they use the KPI expression. The point now is what kind of KPI we need now and what does it mean to get an assessment in what we do through the design. So I really like the fact that uh, this book, uh, in a way, presents many practical problems, but also many opportunities, which is really what uh, the designer thinks 
when they approach uh, to, to a contest, to a scenario, and they found them opportunities. They don't just collect and select problems, but instead they create new opportunities for, for the food system in this case. So very briefly, how the book it is structured. I decided to uh, ask, and I'm very happy they accepted, three uh, colleagues, friends, and an and expert in their field to provide their prologues, their, their point of view uh, as a starting uh, point of this book. And I got three different prologues. Uh, I asked food designer Anim Bani to provide their own view. And I asked an activist, also an entrepreneur, Mark Buckley, to uh, provide his view connected also with the sustainable development goals approach and what we had to do in the industry as well. And the third, uh, um, and the third uh, prologue is based uh, on, on design approach and what design can actually do in a, in a challenge, in, a, in, in the way how they appro it approach to, to the food system. And I thoroughly thanks uh, Professor Lorenzo Imbesi from La Sapienza University for providing us this uh, this uh, this prologue. And then the book, as I told you, is including uh, 18 different contributions. And those contributions are in a way clustered, as designers do, they cluster all the time, in cluster in four main parts of case studies, of course. The first part is dedicated to design method for food supply chain. The second part is dedicated to design method for new food experiences. And the third part is dedicated to design method for food and sustainability education, which for me is a paramount part because we really need to uh, teach people to become not only food designer, but also food changers, food makers, and in a way, change makers in the food system if we, want, if we really want to see the food system becoming healthier and more sustainable. And then the fourth part is dedicated to design method for co-participation and food community engagement, very, very related with the education side, but dedicated also to public and to general public that can be part of the change. And at the beginning, at the end, you have my, uh, my introduction and my conclusion that in a way sum up what was uh, the, the clustering I decided to do about all of those contributions, but also what kind of takeaway I really want that people keep from, from this book. So today we are here with uh, three of the authors uh, that are also in three of the sector of the, of the book and uh, not in this order, but I will invite them to briefly uh, describe uh, what, uh, what they present in their, in their article. And then we will discuss with one question each uh, and we will go more in depth on this uh, design approach and transdisciplinary approach of the design that we can provide in the food and sustainability. So as I told you before, it's also travel and a, and a journey uh, all around the world because Zonata is in the, is in the United States, uh, Angela Colucci, Lorenza, uh, Scanzetta, uh, they are from Italy, but they will tell us that they did this uh, uh, case study in, 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 in Brazil. And then we got the, the case studies from Australia, thanks to Emily Ballantyne that will provide us uh, more details about that. So I'm going to uh, introduce and to ask to come uh, in, uh, in on the stage, um, Emily, if possible. Let me see if I can get out from this. I hope uh, uh, my, my explanation was giving you an idea on what is inside of uh, this book uh, more concretely. And um, Emily, I'm going to leave this, the, the virtual stage to you. And please tell us, of course, more about you and more about um, your article. Thank you very much, Sonia. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and um, all the way from Tasmania, Australia, um, from Magical Farm. Um, that's where I live. And it's a beautiful regenerative farm that's sort of uh, a, my, my home now. And um, after all of uh, lots of work, we've we've landed here and we're doing sort of uh, every day we wake up and we're cultivating the soil and that kind of thing. But going going to the the work of food food design, um, my contribution has been very much around this iterative kind of process of. Uh, design experimentation with various different communities 
um, in a in a design activist way, as a design policymaker, as um, in in academia with students, um, and I have developed in my in my research um, various theories you could say around food systems design and there's if, if you um, sort of look closer into it um, in convivial food systems design is the theoretical work that I've developed from all of this experimentation and um, it's very much conviv is it's all about with life it's regenerative food systems design and looking at ways that we can um, both relationally and tactically design a new food system. It's very much about a critique of the industrial food system and replacing that, um, proposing an alternative, you could say, for food designers to think about a, a, a regenerative way to design around food. Uh, so the convivial food system is made up of very... Um, uh, relational and tactical um, uh, elements to help designers to um, reimagine how they could uh, approach what they're designing, you know. And uh, so within, um, within the work, um, in particular in the book, um, one of the, the case studies that I've shared is in Shepparton, which is in regional Victoria. And in that context, um, I worked with um, students from RMIT University in Melbourne, and we we took um, over the course of uh, 20, 2019, we took, sorry, and 20, 2018 and 2019, we took um, about 100 design students up to Shepparton, which is three hours north of Melbourne. And this is very much in, in Australia, um, the, the food bowl of Australia, where lots of uh, um, fruit is grown, um, quite a lot of vegetables, and it, it's where two big canneries are. So it's, it's a very um, industrial food system, and it's a, it's a funny place because the health outcomes of the, the town are quite um, uh, questionable, like there's quite a high obesity um, so it's very ironic that there's such beautiful fresh food being grown there, um, but um, there's a McDonald's um, on every corner um, and all the food's being shipped out to the rest of Australia, essentially. So we came in as designers and we did various different design interventions, but they were convivial food systems design interventions. They were relational and tactical ways to... Um, uh, approach how we would maybe propose a new vision for Shepparton, okay? So we worked with the local government, we worked with local business people, um, and you can read more in the in the chapter <laughs> to get to get more. But um, we we had some really interesting um, outcomes, you could say, because there there was um, something that something that really tangible that came from the work was a food box program, and the students actually designed this we, in in re, in collaboration with the farmers. They um, and they sold the food boxes via the local radio station and through their local networks, and they network. It was a network solution with the farmers, and they designed. Um, they co-designed this food box and then distributed the box out to to the town. So it was really, um, uh, yeah, quite an, a, 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 a practical um, thing for the students to to be involved in. And um, then um, this, all of this work has been um, reflect reflected on and 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 worked with by me, I suppose. In, in a sense, that's um, my PhD outcomes was really developing this convivial food systems design um, framework for, for, for people. And designers, I'm saying, well, they're not just um, designers as such in the professional context, but really we can understand designers to be in, the, in everyday life. So I'm looking at the professional and the un, not, not professional, like the people that are living in the everyday. Um, and they can, anyone can use, the, it's a very egalitarian framework, you could say. 
but I'm um, interested in how the convivial food systems design can change uh, at a local level. So really um, the the wider globalization, urbanization, industrialization, all these big things have led to this alienated food system and not necessarily the best outcomes. So we're really looking at a local convivial regenerative uh, approach and these case studies um, and this one in, in the book illustrate uh, are an illustration and an example of um, designing um, in this beautiful local networked way and convivial way uh, a, a new a new way of living really a new way of um, relating to each other food can be this revolutionary um, tool and element to change everyday life and um, as from a design perspective we are in a beautiful um, position and I'm very excited um, how this can be a part of significant social change and also just <laughs> healthy, healthier way of living for individuals. So there's sort of a even let's let's go into the the and and tell me Sonia when I'm over time. That's, that's <laughs> it's okay. Me, no, it's perfect. And this is introduced like a very short question for you for ending. Yes. And of course, we invited people to read the the article and read the paper so they will go more in depth in this. But I met you in 2015 when you came to Italy to present to the first uh, European uh, conference uh, on food design. And the, the question uh, that I put as a, I, I was directing the conference, the first European conference, and I put a subtitle on the title of the conference, which was Understanding Food Design. And many people came by saying, you know, I'm here for understanding food design by sharing my experience with others. And I think we met first needs. You were studying at that point. I'm so happy to see that this is a process that started with your study and became real things. I mean, this is something that really works in, in the real life. It is not just like a concept coming out from your, from your thesis. You were working on something that nowadays it is scalable and is, impact, is impacting in the life of the people. I have only very quick question for you before passing to the others because you know our time is limited. Yes. How difficult it was to bring government and people far away from design creativity and this kind of approach to your project. Very briefly, and I know there are also those kind of information in the paper so people can also enjoy more info there. It's it, the question could relate to lots of different case studies. So in different contexts, the government and sort of big business were involved in some way and some more successfully and some not, let's say. Um, so in the Shepparton context, it's a very conservative regional town and if they're listening to this, they know it. Like it was not easy <laughs> working with them at certain points in time and in the end it was actually a local businessman um, who is the owner of the old SPC factory that was the major change agent in the picture of Shepparton. So it wasn't actually the local government. That said, in other contexts, local government has been really, really um, engaged and involved. But my, my issue is that the commodification of the ideas is happening in local government. They're not following through. They love to write about it and they love us designers to do beautiful reports about it, but they're not doing implementation. So that's why I really started on these small experimentations, these safe to fail experimentations where you're designing a food box program. So everything I do now is kind of, I do not write a report. I say, no, no, I'm actually, I want to do experimentation with your community. I want to co-design a service food service design solution, like the food box um, or a convivial dinner or a lunch yeah. and, and bring people together. The kind of assessment that is changing, you know, assessment being means scalability, being impactful and mean also changing uh, the, the, the mindset and way of thinking. I really exactly. thank you, Emily. I have to jump yeah. to the part number three of the book where we have the other author. Uh, here, I'm happy to introduce Jonathan, uh, who actually 
um, is in the side of the book dedicated to design method for food and sustainability education. But uh, he will provide us an example that bring academia and practitioners together. So the connection and the bridge is very uh, tangible in this in this case study. So I leave the stage to you and thank you, Emily, again. Thanks, Sonia, and thanks, Emily. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm John Deutsch. I'm a professor of culinary arts and science at Drexel University in Philadelphia. I, I direct the Drexel Food Lab. Um, and our area is really product design, so uh, a lot more uh, narrowly focused than uh, the broad scale uh, type of work that Emily described, which is one of the wonderful things about food design. And I've had some, some spirited discussions with food designers in, in the past about where food product fits in the bigger design. But um, I would say we do you know, uh, consumer informed uh, product design. So most of our work is with food companies. Uh, the case I wrote about in the book is actually our first project outside of the food industry, and it's with a healthcare company and a health insurance company. They specifically wanted us to work with um, oral liquid nutrition supplements, like Ensure. I might uh, try to share my screen um, if I can, just to give a visual, not a, I promise not a PowerPoint presentation, but just a visual of the product I'm talking about. Um, so these kinds of drinks that I think are, their brands are different globally, but the idea is the same. It's um, nutrition in a beverage. And um, the insurance company came to us um, with a very specific request, which is how do we get people um, drinking these and complying with these? Um, so there's very low um, satisfaction and very low compliance with these products. Um, and so there's like, a, we call it in the paper, a trifecta of inadequacy. People don't like them, they don't drink them, and they're expensive. And so this is everything we don't want our food to be. Um, so we worked with, um, and I'm skipping a bunch of things, we worked with consumers to find out what they do want and what they do value in their food products. Um, and if you go back to this idea, the, the main problem we found is it doesn't fit into lifestyle. So if they're sick in bed in a hospital and it comes on their tray or the dietitian tells them to take it, they will. Um, but when they're at home, it just, you know, we don't grow up eating this kind of food, so it doesn't fit into lifestyle. So what does fit into lifestyle? Um, and we're working with older adults in particular uh, who are prescribed this product. Um, the, they love the freezer. Many of them live alone. They don't have access to daily shopping. They're worried about food waste. So they love things in the freezer. They rely on the freezer for their meals. Even if they, um, they're they not this Soylent fuel generation, even if they can have an energy bar on the way to work uh, like we do, um, they want a real meal, uh, three meals a day. They want to cook for themselves as best they can. Um, and they have sweet tooths. They want ice cream. They want cakes. They eat pastries for breakfast. Um, and when I'm uh, in my, my later years, I hope to do the same thing and not worry too much about uh, what's, what's going to happen to my waistline. Um, and so all of this work, um, worked together. We had about 50 ideas of different food products. And this was the big winner, which is a very simple solution. Um, but it's putting it, uh, the same nutrition into a format that is, um, is usable to the consumers. Um, some of these exist on the market already, but they tend to be high protein ice creams. And when you suspend protein in milk, you get basically grainy, uh, grainy kind of uh, texture. And so the innovation of this um, product is um, the other thing we heard was that the, these therapeutic products, therapeutic ice creams and so on are very infantilizing for consumers. They feel like children. And you know, you have this idea um, both at the beginning of life and at the end of life um, you're in. You're being pushed on something with wheels. You're wearing diapers. You're being 
worried about and cared for, and they don't like that. It was very infantilizing for them. So the innovation with this ice cream is it has chunks and inclusions, and that inclusion is a um, functional uh, cookie dough. So it has protein, it has fiber, it has um, added features that, that they like. So um, that's what I wrote the case about. Um, we are now in a clinical trial phase, which I'm very excited about working with our nursing faculty to um, see how this actually works in terms of, uh, we, we did one, one part, which is how it works in terms of patient satisfaction and had great results. Um, but we're now trying to do the quantitative clinical trial to see actually if it works in terms of weight and uh, nutrition and health outcomes, not just uh, the sensory um, satisfaction and the willingness to, willingness to buy and those kinds of measures. So I think that's my time. I'll stop there and, and move to You questions. are always great, Jonathan. And with the time, you are, you are perfect. So I really thank you for that. And I just want to also share and an, like uh, something happened within me and you. You send me the paper and say, is it this food design? Is it this something you can go in the category of design? And, and, and my answer was definitely this, and it is the transdisciplinarity that you want to bring to the attention that also make the difference. So I was mentioned academia and industry together, but also, you know, the commercial side. But I wonder, you mentioned nutritionists, you mentioned scientists in sensory, I mean, expert, you know, sensor design expert in. So many people with many knowledge, with many competences, what kind of suggestion you can give us on, on the next uh, next future also in education because I believe you got also the best case studies of teaching uh, that can be can be in a way shared so I think this should be the future also of teaching how to approach the design yeah thank you for mentioning that so <clears throat> one thing I didn't mention is the the work in this in this project came from a um, undergraduate course so this was um, a class in food product development that is a required class for um, students majoring in nutrition and in food science. Um, and historically, we've had a lot of resistance, especially from the nutrition students who think, I don't know, I don't need to know. The class is called food product development. They think, I don't need to know this. The food industry is the bad, you know, the evil entity. I'm trying to help people battle the food system. It's this very sort of um, violent rhetoric and, uh, you know, my, our position is, you know, the food industry is made of people. Um, yes, it's market driven and it's capitalist and, and we can have discussions about, um, you know, whether that's a, the right system. But the reality is, even if we uh, feel very virtuous about shopping at the farmer's market on Saturday or uh, growing our tomatoes in our garden, we're all getting most of our calories from this industrial food system uh, as, as are most people in the world. And food has never been safer and, and cheaper than it is now. Uh, I'm not saying any of that to minimize the very serious problems in the, in the food industry, but, but to say that um, I think our students need to learn how to work with the food industry and, and work from inside it rather than see it as nutrition and public health on one side and food on the other side and uh, battling it out because I think it's as people like Mary and Nessel have shown the the public health side will always lose uh, you know resource wise in, in that battle right but we're having a lot of success uh, collaboratively. Thank you for so much because it brings us also to many other topic and issue that we were touching really this morning in the in the in the panel dedicated to academia. So thank you, Jonathan. I'm going to invite on the stage uh, our uh, next guests and speakers and authors of the of uh, and contribution that is in the part four design method for co-participation and food community engagement. And I leave the stage to you so you can tell us more about what you, your case. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> so uh, we are Andrea Colucci and Lorenza Sganzetta. So I just quickly introduce myself, then after Lorenza can present quickly the, the chapter. So I'm architect and planners, and, and planner, and I'm mm, 
adjunct professor in urban design. So this is my field. This is planning, urban design, regeneration process. This is my focus of the research. But I, I take a look to this aspect of regeneration um, through the lens of the sustainability, the landscape, the resilience, and then the food is one of the lever of this process of regeneration in our city and our territory. This is play a core role inside the, the general regeneration process. And in particular, since the, the 2004, I'm working on, on the resilience and this approach to uh, to, to work on the capacity of resilience, to, to enhance the resilience of our complex system, working on this process, adaptive governance process, involving both institutional and bottom-up or community-led process. So this is part of our core topic in, in the book. So I leave the to Lorenza. Have to share or you share yourself the screen? I, I can share by myself. And so, hello to everybody. I'm uh, Lorenza Sganzetta, and um, actually, I'm the only one I think that I'm not a professor. I'm still a fellow, and um, currently I'm working at the uh, Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna. But at the time uh, when we wrote this contribution for uh, this uh, publication, I was still in the big uh, Milan Polytechnic family. Uh, working arm by arm uh, with uh, Angela. So um, I want to thank you also, Sonia, for being part uh, of uh, this very, very interesting book, uh, both for uh, the different point of views uh, that are presented, uh, but, uh, but also of uh, the graphics and the very, very uh, plain and clear way in which it's uh, easy to follow each part uh, the clusterization that you were talking about before, I think is very efficient in a way. It's very easy and simple. That is, is not always like that in the academic publication. We all know. So uh, maybe I can share a very a few slides uh, just to introduce you a um, brief synthesis of, of our, of our um, chapter. Okay. Maybe. Tell me if it's, if you can see everything. No presentation. Yes, it works. Okay, it's fine with you? You can see the slides? Yes. yes. Okay, okay. So our contribution uh, um, talks about the role of food design in a very specific case study in a favela in uh, Rio de Janeiro in Brazil that is the largest one, and uh, it's called the Rocinha, maybe you already heard about it, and um, it's characterized basically by social and physical disconnection from the city and uh, other, and other, other prob problematics. And our focus was to uh, understand how to uh, create a, a sort of a, a regeneration plan uh, about food, but uh, not only, uh, in order to um, unify uh, this, uh, this uh, different context of the favela and the, 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 the bigger and broader, um, and the broader uh, uh, environment of the city. So this, uh, this, uh, our contribution was part of a bigger project that uh, is called the Polymi para Rocinha, that uh, was uh, a winning project of uh, 2015 and 2016 Poly Social Award. Uh, since the beginning, the partnership has included a broad range of actors, universities, NGOs, and um, as I was mentioning before, was uh, basically focused on the, the favela of Lucinia. That is also characterized by a high density and limited access to uh, sustainable quality life and uh, uh, sustainable food. So our, our contribution uh, came in this specific part. This because, I, I mentioned this because uh, in general, a regeneration of slums and of uh, this, uh, this kind of uh, marginalized fringe of city uh, requires an integrated approach based on different components. And in fact, our theoretical background is uh, called IMM, 
and it's, uh, and it's, it's broader than just uh, the, the steps that we took for the food planning. Um, all the projects that are inside uh, this uh, Polini Para Rossigna contribution uh, were connected, but uh, our, our food strategies proposal uh, had uh, more direct synergies uh, with um, the, the, the three parts in the middle that you see on the thematic assets that are uh, um, that deals with water management, ecosystem services, and waste management. So the first part of our work was to map, in a way, all the projects and um, NGOs uh, in initiatives that were already active uh, on the territory and that were uh, working on minimizing food waste, uh, on uh, urban agriculture, on, in general, uh, micro-scale uh, food security initiatives. And uh, basically, they were all led by uh, local cooperatives and uh, local uh, and local actors. So, after uh, mapping uh, the, 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 the initiatives that were uh, for us more interesting, we tried to understand also which practices uh, at, uh, an, an, at, a, at another level, at an another scale, were already uh, implemented also by the city. So a sort of comparison between uh, bottom-up initiatives and uh, and uh, more, um, how can I say, more um, public uh, public actor uh, public actors interventions. And uh, after this work uh, of planning, we think, of course, uh, also of a sort of the integration of a proposal. Uh, also, always with this idea of uh, using a uh, holistic approach that was following the IMM, uh, the IMM uh, background. Uh, and we understood that the need was to integrate food uh, urban, uh, so, sorry, food in the urban complex system uh, in this process of regeneration. So uh, the proposal were basically this uh, idea of micro-urban farming, uh, the community modular food hub that uh, was composed by other sub-projects, and, uh, um, and, and, and a final, another final project of aquaponic uh, also, also related to urban farming and to water management and, uh, and, uh, and the other dimensions. This was part uh, of uh, the Food Hub, uh, was uh, another micro-scale project uh, more connected with bees and with the, the production of uh, honey. And, um, and, and so maybe, maybe the most important part uh, of our contribution is just to say that we understood through a practical case study that uh, um, there is really, really a urgent need to make this integration, not just between food and urban, but also between food, urban and regenerative processes that are not uh, uh, standing alone and uh, separately. And uh, even when we are working on uh, local, uh, very local and micro scale, uh, we have to deal uh, with uh, the different subjects and the stakeholders that are involved and that already uh, started uh, something um, on our, uh, on our, uh, mm, sorry, before us, this I was, uh, I, I was saying. So, um, thank you. And if you have uh, any question, we are available. Thank you, and thank you, Lienza, and thank you Angela, for your explanation. My connection was not great. I know that we have uh, very limited time and uh, before they will cut the, <laughs> the connection, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, I really want to thank all of you. And I want to underline something you said at the beginning, which is the fact that this book, uh, it is, oh, can you hear me? Please give me a feedback. We can, can hear, you hear me. Yeah, yes. you can. Perfect. Yeah. 
it's important. If you don't see me, it's fine, but it is important that you hear me. I like the fact that you're underlining that this is a book uh, that is made also by academia, but not only for the academia. It wants to be a way of communicating with people outside of the academia. So definitely, thanks for your contribution for all your case studies. I'm pretty sure the people will understand how many places, how many um, systems and how many scenarios we can really apply the design. So for me, the questions for you, and I believe you answered already with your, uh, with your presentation was, is it this social design, sustainable design, <laughs> systemic design, urban design? So everybody tried to put like one word before design, but I would like to answer that this is design, design method applied to make systems to, and of course to engage people in the process of designing, which is, which is. So for me, we, our time is over and I want to thank all of you. I want to thank all of the authors also because this book came out during the pandemia and it was hard for all of us to be connected, to be focused on what we were doing. So for me, it was also a personal thanks to a last chapter uh, the conclusion, I'm also defining what is the mindset that design has to work in the food and sustainability sector. Man's mindset we can transfer to the others and help them to approach to problems with creativity. So I suggest you to go also to the conclusion and see how all of those case studies in a way foster this kind of uh, new mindset that we need to improve by education, by curricula, by also creating bridges between us, so the academia and the real world, the people that really need the design in the food and sustainability. So thank you again. Our time is over. I hope to get uh, in touch with you. You can contact me. And uh, if you are interested to be part of uh, other projects, please let me know. OK, thank you. Great. Thanks, Sonia. Um, thanks everyone, Angela, Emily, Jonathan, Lorenza also for this session was great. We will, we can spend hours and hours just talking, but we don't have time as you know, uh, but you talk about this book. We really want to go into this and I think everyone now will go deeper and understand much more about it. Let's see to the next, let's go to the next session. Uh, so have a nice day, everyone. Thank you.